Hello and welcome to the ride, Wichita. Good morning on this beautiful Friday in Wichita, Kansas. I'm Nick Beach. I'm Matt Hopper. And we're here to talk to you about some sports. Football is the main focus today, and we're going to kick it off by starting off with some college football. The season's in full swing, and we got a lot of great action as game day heads to Clemson, South Carolina this week to see the Louisville Cardinals take on the Clemson Tigers. The big story here, Heisman frontrunner, quarterback of Louisville, Lamar Jackson heads to Clemson to face Deshaun Watson and the mighty Clemson Tigers. This should be a doozy. It's going to be a great game. We, I mean, we think it's going to be a great game, but you never know after uh, Louisville ran into Florida State and blew them out. So what are you thinking about this game, Matt? Yeah, it, it's hard to say. I remember so many people thought Florida State-Louisville was going to be um, an enormous game, one of the best games of the year, and uh, Louisville didn't even have a, a problem with them. Um, I'm think I'm thinking Louisville's going to win this one. Um, I think it'll be interesting. Uh, I I definitely think the most interesting part will be Deshaun Watson, just because um, a lot of people are predicting him to go first in the NFL draft or close up there. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see what he does um, in this situation. What do you think, Nick? Um. I think that Clemson is going to hold their ground at home. It's really tough to predict this one after the blowout that happened in Tallahassee and with how great Louisville is playing. However, I think Clemson is a very experienced team and they're used to the situation. And Deshaun Watson will definitely show up for this game because he always shows up for big games. He's going to make plays all over the field, and the Clemson defense is going to have to do something to stop Lamar Jackson, which is going to be tough. I see a high-scoring affair, which doesn't seem hard to predict, but I see Clemson winning in a close one, I want to say 37-35, something like that. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll stay true. I was, um, I'm predicting Louisville, and I would say even maybe a little higher score than that, maybe 45-41. Yeah, that's not a bad prediction. I think we're going to see a lot of scoring in this one. I mean, any game that Lamar Jackson's playing in, there's going to be a lot of scoring, and I think that Clemson's going to have to keep up. But on the same hand, I think Watson's going to be keeping up in a great way. And really, I mean, I know these are conference games for Louisville, you know, going to Florida State, going to Clemson. But if you look at their non-conference schedule, you got to applaud a team like Louisville, who wasn't expected by anybody to challenge for the college football playoff when the season began. However, they... I mean, they played an FCS team week one, and then they played a nobody week two. But if you look at their game last week, they went to Marshall. Marshall is perennially a decent program in, you know, a week conference. But they they put up a fight, and Louisville waxed them, but, I mean, that was expected. However, Marshall's a pretty good team. And then you look ahead to November 17th later in the season, where Louisville has to go to Houston to play a non-conference game, which should be, you know, it could be potentially both teams are undefeated. It's really hard to predict at this point. But... You look at, like, Louisville has to go to Florida State, to Clemson, and to Houston. If they win all three of those, how could you not make them the number one seed in the college football playoff, you know, being that they win the rest of their games and win the ACC championship? And, you know, Alabama looks great, but I don't see under any circumstance if Louisville wins all those games that they're not the number one seed. What do you think? Yeah, it would be tough. Um, uh, With that said, I think it would be tough to up in Alabama at the number one seed, if anything, um, just the reputation, maybe people won't say that's a factor, but just um, they every game they go in, they win. Um, they had a pretty, it was pretty close against Ole Miss, and by the end they um, ran up the score a little bit, and Ole Miss was supposed to be maybe their most formidable opponent. Um, so I, I just think it's hard to maybe up in Alabama at the number one spot. I don't, I don't think they do it. Yeah, I um. That's a good point. Alabama, you know, everybody's always going to love Alabama and putting them in the number one seed is almost never a bad move. But I really do think if Louisville wins all those games, they're going to be the ones deserving of it. So another great game we actually have tonight as Stanford takes on Washington, a top 10 matchup. I guess this is now when we're really going to see if Washington is for real. They have all this talent, I mean, as does Stanford, and now they get to play this huge game. They went into Arizona last week and won in overtime in a tough place to play. And Washington looks definitely more talented than they have in the past couple years. They have the recruiting. They have the coaching. They have the quarterback now. What do you think about this one, Matt? Do you think Washington's going to challenge Stanford? Yeah, um, I mean, of course you have, you know, the name that everyone's going to talk about is Christian McCaffrey. But um, I think Washington stands a chance. Um, I I think Stanford is a little more uh, beatable than people might think. Um, I think I think it's hard to predict this game. What do you what do you think, Nick? 
Yeah, this one's tough. I mean, it's in Seattle. Washington's favored by three at home, which I think is a little bit leaning a bit too much too much toward them. I would have favored Stanford by maybe one, and then. I don't know, man. This is this is tough. I think the thing with Stanford is they went into UCLA last week and it looked almost like the whole game that they were going to lose, but then UCLA blew it and you know Stanford really came up strong at the end of the game. And with that said, I mean Stanford's a very experienced team and they know how to win these close games. You've seen them do it in the past couple years. It seems regardless who they have playing quarterback, regardless who they have on defense, that they're able to pull out close games. And I think this should be a close one. Maybe another low scoring affair like it was last week with. UCLA, but man, it's really tough. I'm still going with Stanford at Washington in this one, but I do think Washington is, you know, one of the better teams in the Pac-12, and this ranking is not a fluke. If they lose to Stanford, I don't think that's anything to hang their head on, but if they win this game, you got to look at the Washington Huskies as a serious college football playoff contender, even though the Pac-12 does tend to beat up on each other a lot. What do you think about that? Uh, Yeah, I think... If I had to pick, I think I would pick Stanford in this one. Um, just like you said, based on experience, I think it's hard to go against Stanford. They they tend to just um, win these games. Um, I think it'd be really cool for Washington um, to win this big game. I think if they win this, like you said, um, you really would have to look at them. Um, I'm not sure where they would fall in the standings, but they'd probably break out of that 10 spot and go into single digits, I would assume. And um uh, I, I like you said, the Pac-12 or all of those big conferences really tend to be, beat up on each other. So I think it would be hard. Um, I think it's hard for any of the Pac-12 teams to make it into the CFP because it's, it seems like they always have one or two losses um, just by beating up on each other. So it'll be interesting for sure. Yeah, and then our third big game of the weekend is uh, Wisconsin and Michigan. Wisconsin's coming off a huge win in East Lansing against Michigan State, where Michigan has not had too tough of a test to date. And um, this one's shaping up to be a pretty good game, and uh, I believe it's at Michigan. And um, these teams are going to duke it out, Wilton Spate and the Michigan Wolverines and that strong uh, Wisconsin defense. Um, I do look to uh, Michigan to come up strong in this one and to finally dethrone Wisconsin with all their strong wins that they've had so far, although I do think Wisconsin's a pretty good team. But I think... If Michigan's going to do it, I mean, they have all the hype around them. They had, you know, one of the best odds to win the national championship. They're going to do it now. You can't wait any longer, Michigan. I mean, you know, the recruiting's great every year, so they don't got to worry for the upcoming years, I don't think. But there's all this talk about Michigan. If you lose this game, you're in a little bit of trouble because I think Ohio State's very strong, and I think they're going to keep winning and winning, and it's going to be tough for them in the Big Ten East. So, um, yeah, I'm taking Michigan in this one over Wisconsin in – I don't think it's going to be close. I think Michigan's going to finally show their true colors and, you know, beat them by at least two scores. How do you see this one shaping out, Matt? Um, yeah, I, it's kind of hard, uh, to be honest, to try to predict it. I, um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I didn't, I don't know if maybe it was just me, but I don't think I really had Wisconsin on my top 10 radar when the season started. That could just be me overlooking them. Um, I think Michigan will win. I'm not sure if it'll be by two scores, uh, just because I, I, I tend to think Wisconsin might be a little bit better than that. But um, say, say Michigan does lose this game, um, do, do you think they can't come back and um, catch up to Ohio State? You, th- you don't think that's a possibility? I mean, I think the only way that they can do that is beating Ohio State head-to-head at the end of the season, and I don't think that's going to happen because Michigan has not beat Ohio State in recent years. They've got blown out, or they lose in close games, they lose in heartbreakers. They can't find a way to beat Ohio State, and I don't think they're going to once again this season. And um, I look to Ohio State to potentially go undefeated heading into the Big Ten Championship game against most likely Wisconsin is what I'm looking at. And... um, Yeah, so those are our three big games of the week. I mean, we got in a lot of other great action. But another big story that came out of college football this past week was um, last Saturday, the Auburn Tigers defeated the LSU Tigers um, on what was, you know, essentially the last play. LSU had a shot. It looked like they scored, but they'd ran out of time. And on Sunday, the LSU Tigers decided to finally fire Coach Les Miles and then As soon as interim coach Ed Orgeron took over, he fired offensive coordinator Cam Cameron as well as their offenses scuffled in, you know, the last year or so. And, um, yeah, this is a tough one. I mean, I thought Les Miles should have been fired at the end of the season, and people were going, oh, you go 9-3, and you go 8-4, and you shouldn't be fired, and the competition's too high in the SEC to set that high of a standard for these guys, and I completely disagree. You have to set a high standard for these guys. If you go 9-3, and three, if you go 8-4 and four at LSU, that's not good enough. You have to be competing for a playoff spot every year. 
as LSU, and I think they needed a new coach and they needed a change. And Les Miles refused to change over while all these other coaches were trying to keep up with Saban. They were, you know, trying to get a more high-powered offense, focus on the quarterback, focus on recruiting offensive players, and Les Miles just wasn't doing it. He refused to try to get a good quarterback. He only focused on the run. He runs the ball way too much, and it's just not working out for LSU. So LSU's going to need a new head coach, and you've heard a couple names thrown around right now, but um, they probably won't fill the position till you know, after the end of the season, Orgeron will just take over, and they'll probably, you know, do a mediocre job during that time, and uh, one of the names that I've heard pop up is Art Bryles, the former Baylor head coach, and people are saying, you know, the top, the three front runners for the LSU job are Jimbo Fisher of Florida State, Tom Herman of Houston, and Art Bryles of Baylor, but people think Bryles, Bryles could be unlikely because they don't know if he's going to be allowed to coach at such a, on a such a big program if people are you know going to be all right with that. I think at this point that the LSU administration and athletic director aren't going to care. I think that Art Bryles is going to be the guy for LSU. They know he can recruit. They know he has a high-powered offense, and this is exactly what LSU needs to stop Nick Saban going forward and kind of dethrone Alabama as one of the better teams in the SEC. And I think when all said and done, the SEC is able to get away with whatever they want, and if Bryles has his problems, they're still going to hire him. Um, how do you see this shaping up? Yeah, um, that's an interesting uh, theory. I, I, I kind of like um, Art Bryles at LSU, like you said, um, going to focus on the quarterback, going to focus on um, getting offense. I have a hard time seeing um, them getting Fisher. Um, maybe a little bit easier time seeing them getting Herman. Although I think um, at a program like Houston, where they um, where they love football, where they're not in a, um, in a big conference yet, but um, I, I think he's probably exalted there. I think um, the hype is there. I think it'd be really hard for um, him to leave a program like that, where he's probably very well respected and loved, um, and go into LSU, where it's you know they could fi- like this, they could fire you for losing two games. Um, I, I think Browse is the um, the name that I've heard that is most likely. Um, like you said, I think it would be hard to say whether or not they would allow him after everything that happened. But like you said, I think if anyone could get with, away with it, it could be LSU, it could be the SEC. Um, I think it's not it, – it's so much the fans. It's, you, you, you know, you're going to – they're going to announce our Bryles or they're going to put his name out there and maybe see – um, what the you know if the fans are protesting or something like that. Um, but I, I think our brows would definitely be a good fit for LSU, or um, maybe not a good fit at this moment, but some maybe like a good refresher um, for what they need right now. Yeah, definitely, and I see that too. And you know, I talked about Jimbo Fisher a little bit, and his name's popped up, and that one confuses me a little bit. <clears throat> you saw Jimbo Fisher's name pop up um, when it came to the Texas job when uh, Mac Brown was gone. And uh, you're seeing him pop up for LSU now. You know, the thing that I was asking myself all week was, what in the heck makes uh, Louisiana State University better than Florida State University? Why does he want to go there? The recruiting is equal at Florida State. You don't have as much pressure on you in the ACC. You have an equal shot to make the college football playoff, as you know. The recruiting is great, and you've had good teams the past couple years. And if you take down Clemson, you take down the other powers, you're going to make it. And if, if you have the best record, I don't understand. Why would you go to LSU? I think there's only a couple jobs that Jimbo Fisher could ever leave for Florida State, and that's Alabama and I mean, I'm hard-pressed to find very many others because Florida State's won a national championship in the past five years. They've made the college football playoff another time. I really don't understand why he would leave, and I don't see him doing it, even though they said that he was under consideration and very close to taking the job at the end of last season when they ultimately decided to keep Les Miles for what was only a couple more games. And um, I really don't see Fisher leaving Florida State, but how do you feel about this whole situation? Do you disagree, or how do you feel? Um... I, I don't think he's going to leave. Um, my thought is maybe why he would leave. I think there's, especially where we are right now in college football, um, and maybe this isn't fair, but I think the SEC is just seen as bigger. Um, the, you know, Like you said, not as much pressure in the ACC. You, um, maybe you can say that uh, he would want to be in the SEC. You know, It's more competition. Um, there's more hype. Um, I think, I, I can't remember if we have or not, but I definitely um, think you could see two SEC teams and, you know, the four-team college football playoff where I think it would be hard for any other conference to do that. Um, so I, I think there are just the hype of the SEC. As far as LSU, I don't think there's any different other than uh, – I, I don't know if there's really any difference between LSU and Florida State as far as fans. Um, I don't know how much money or anything like that. I, I don't think he would leave, but if he did, um, it would just be maybe that um, 
extra experience of being in what some people might consider the best conference in the college football? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the SEC is valued the highest, whether or not they actually are the best conference. You you don't really know at this point. I mean, it seems to be that they're pretty good. And uh, here's a question I actually have. I mean, Alabama looks the strongest right now and, you know, number one team in the country and they're playing well and everybody expects them to make the college football playoff. And you talk about potentially two teams making it. I don't see that happening just because, you know, competitive balance losses are going to happen and only one team wins the SEC championship. So they're going to have a hard time putting two teams in. But who do you think has the best chance out of the SEC to stop Alabama, whether it be in their side or whether it be in the other side in the SEC championship game, to stop them and make the college football playoff in place of them? Um. Yeah, I. that's hard. I might have said at the beginning of the season, I might have said Ole Miss just because they've done it um, the past two, two years. If I'm thinking right now, um, I don't know. I have a hard time saying Tennessee. I feel like that might be a popular pick um, to get them eventually. Um, they were, you know, they've been shaky. I think they had a um, good week last week. Um, I, I, I hate to say this. I hate to say that a team can't be beaten, but it's looking at the SEC. I can't think of a team where I, I'm just, wow, I don't, I don't think Alabama could beat them or wow. I think, um, Alabama would really struggle with them. And, um, as much as I want to find a team like that, I'm not sure if there is one at this moment. Yeah, okay. I can definitely see that. And I think, like you said, Tennessee would be a popular pick. And I think Tennessee's playing good ball right now, but I still don't think they're up to par with Alabama. A team that I look at who it's hard to still predict if they're, you know, at college football playoff contender status, but they're playing really good ball. And this team really looks like they could challenge Alabama for a playoff spot. And that's the Texas A&M Aggies. I think that a&M going into the season, I was like, yeah, they'll have another decent year. They'll make a decent bowl game, and they're not going to be great. And I was looking at Trevor Knight, and I was like, eh, he's transferring from Oklahoma because he lost his job. I mean, he's an okay quarterback, but I don't know how great he can be. But, I mean, man, this, this team is pulling it out against good teams right now. They're playing great ball. Trevor Knight looks like a great leader. They're excited again. They look like they're ready to beat Alabama. I mean, I don't know if they will, but I think they have the best chance right now. Uh, even a little bit better chance of Tennessee because Tennessee's been known for blowing some games that they probably, you know, shouldn't lose. And they haven't done that, you know, to date this season, which is good for them. They definitely need to get over the hump. But I think A&M is the strongest team besides Alabama going forward in this conference. And, um, yeah, that wraps it up for our uh, college football segment for this week. And so now we're going to transition into the NFL. So week four coming up, you know, we got a couple of great games and, uh, Right now, we got uh, five undefeated teams in the NFL, and uh, we're going to play a little game that I like to call contender or pretender with these undefeated teams. And uh, contender, you know, is kind of, we're going to go, going to make the playoffs and has a shot to make a run. And then pretender is likely going to miss the playoffs or come up short in some way, I think. And so we got five of them, and let's start off with the New England Patriots, and I'm going contender because uh, no matter who they have at quarterback, they're going to win, and Brady's coming back soon. I don't see them not winning the AFC East now. Yeah, um, just not much else to say about that. But, yeah, I don't know how you say um, they're not a contender when they've won with literally anyone at quarterback at this point. Um, Also, if you're looking at the AFC East, I don't really know uh, who's going to beat them. Dolphins lost last night. Um, The Jets look okay. I don't know. It's I, I and I. That's a very uh, okay. But um, I I'm just not sure who would beat them if anyone was going to beat them. So. Yeah, yeah. No one's taken down New England in that division. And I, I mean, I looked to 13, 14 wins for them and to be at the top of the AFC. The next team we have is Denver, Super Bowl champions, and they're back. I mean, a lot of people expected them to regress, but I mean, I guess they're proven their exact point that they made last year that. The defense is going to be great, and we don't even need great quarterback play. And however, I mean, Simeon's been, you know, at worst, he's been decent. So that's that's all they really need. That's all they really need to win a bunch of games. And I mean, I still think they're in a tough division, so they'll lose a few games. And I mean, I see them getting the other bye in the AFC and, you know, making a run in the playoffs. And, you know, Simeon's young. He's going to make a couple mistakes, but I think his defense is going to back him up. You saw the quarterbacks made mistakes last year, too. I'm still going contender with Denver for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely, especially after um... – what a for you know week one against Carolina and maybe people are starting to say they're not as good as maybe they thought but um week one against Carolina last week against Cincinnati uh two good teams um I I just think like you said just the defense has played really well um I thought the defense was going to regress after losing a couple key players 
Um, biggest, I think, is Trevathan at linebacker. Um, they, they seem to fill it pretty well. Brandon Marshall's doing a good job. Um, Shane Ray's doing a pretty good job. Um, so I, I think uh, they're doing pretty well there. I think, like you said, Simeon at best is decent. I think he's a little, I think he's good. Maybe that's too strong of a word for three games in, but I think he's doing pretty good right now. And I definitely see them as a contender. I don't, I don't think they're gonna. Um, I do want to say I think they're gonna win the AFC West. I think, um, I, I starting to think that maybe Oakland isn't as good as maybe I thought they were gonna be. Maybe Kansas City's better though. So we'll have to look at that, but. Yeah, it's a good point that I don't know if, I don't know what's going on with Oakland, but I mean their defense looked bad and then they had a good week, but I don't know, they're playing Tennessee and it's hard to predict what's going to shape up under Denver over there in the West. But um so we have one more undefeated team in the AFC and that's the Baltimore Ravens and this one's a little bit puzzling to me and uh you know, it's hard to say pretender for any 3 and 0 team because you're off to such a great start and if you think about it, you only have to go 7 and 6 for the rest of the year to go 10 and 6. But I'm still going to go pretender with Baltimore. They've beat a couple of teams that do not appear to be very strong. They beat Cleveland, you know, they beat Jacksonville, who is supposed to be a little better, but they look terrible. And um, I think that uh, Baltimore is still a pretender, and I think that when push comes to shove, that Pittsburgh and Cincinnati are both going to be better than them in that division, and they're going to drop off. I think Baltimore is going to miss the playoffs, and I think the thing looking at it with them is they're finding ways to win, and I think they have good coaching, but I don't think they exactly have the talent that they need to get there. They don't have all the weapons on offense. They have basically a non-existent running game they have no idea who their running back is um Flacco's okay but his weapons are proving that you know they're just mediocre even though there's a lot of them that I don't know I mean their defense has done a good job but I think once they face some more high-powered offenses they're going to start to lose some games I look for Baltimore to maybe be eight and eight or nine and seven at the end of the year yeah I, I think I agree with you pretty well um the Against the Browns and Jaguars, they weren't even really good wins. They were pretty close. Um, And like you said, I think the biggest thing is I think Cincinnati and Pittsburgh are going to be pretty good, and so I think it's going to be hard to compete with them. Um, I'm not sure who I would pick over Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, but um, I don't think I don't think Baltimore um, would be over either of them. So. Yeah, I agree with that. And now we go over to the NFC. We have two undefeated teams over there. And the first one we have is the Minnesota Vikings, led by Sam Bradford, who was traded, you know, just before the season started. And they're doing a great job. They won that, you know, that first game in their new stadium on Sunday night against Green Bay, which was a huge win. Their defense is playing well. And many people have them as the best team in the NFC in their power rankings right now. And um, yeah, they mean they look to be playing great. They lost Adrian Peterson. They've proven they don't need him against Carolina. And I mean, I think the lack of, I, I mean, I don't know. I think they'll be able to run the ball okay, but I think a little bit of the lack of weapons will catch up to them a little bit. But I do think that Mike Zimmer's coaching them great. They're doing a really good job, and they're doing all they can to prove they're one of the better teams in the NFC, regardless, because they built this thing from the ground up, and um, they're playing great defense, and that's a good recipe for success. I'm going contender on Minnesota. I think they're a playoff team. Yeah, um, to say they were building from the ground up, you know, they've been drafting defensive players for a couple of years now, and I think it's really starting to pay off. I, I think they, um, I think I think this one's hard to say. I think if there is a, I think they're a contender, but I, I would say I would preface it with, it's very close. Um, I think they could go like nine and seven, ten and six, maybe um, still make the playoffs. I think, um, possibly depending on whatever what everyone else says in the NFC. Um, I think they're good. Um, I think it'll be interesting at the end of the year. I think Sam Bradford's doing pretty well, um, which I don't know if it's surprising. but Yeah, yeah, Bradford's doing a good job. I think that he's just proving that, I mean, I think that when Bradford was drafted in the NFL, that everybody wanted him to be superhuman because he was a Heisman Trophy winner and he's getting paid all this money and he's still getting paid a lot of money. But um, I think the thing with Bradford is he just has to be put into the right situation. He's been in the wrong situation basically his whole career until now, and he um, is coming out with some victories now. He just needs help around him. He just, you know, he needs protection. He's doing better under duress this year, which was something he did a really poor job with last year, and um, I think that's really going to help him going forward, especially with a couple injuries on the Minnesota offensive line. But I think, um, yeah, Minnesota's good, but I think— it's hard to look past what appears to be the class of the NSC right now, the other 3-0 and team, and that's the Philadelphia Eagles. And they're in what looks to be a stronger NFC East this year. A lot of people didn't think that. I mean, Dallas looks good. New York doesn't look bad. I think Washington's going to rip off a couple wins that people aren't expecting. So the Eagles are in a bit of a tough situation. But how can you ignore the play of rookie Carson Wentz? He's doing a great job. And 
you know, it's hard to say this because it's still only through three games and their momentum could, you know, stop a little bit with the bye this week. But the Eagles are 3-0. and They're doing exactly what they need to do. They haven't turned the ball over once. They got the number one scoring defense in the NFL. And I'm going contender with the Eagles, I think, playoff team shot to make a run. Yeah, um, I think I think they're off to a good start. I think Carson Wentz is doing um, really well. Um, I'm not is the numbers five touchdowns and no interceptions. I'm not sure on that, but it's something um, close to that. Yeah, he's playing really well. The Eagles' defense is doing really well. Um, I don't know um, how well they were predicted to do, but they're definitely doing um, good there. I I'm gonna go contender. Um, I to, I'm going to give you this question: Who do you think, if anyone upends the Eagles, uh, who do you, in the NFC East or yeah, uh, who do you think would do that? I go the Cowboys. I think um, Prescott looks good. He looks really good as a rookie, and I mean, I don't think he's Carson Wentz. I don't think he has all the same tools that Wentz has, and I think that Dallas has their problems. I mean, they don't have a very strong defense, and I mean, their secondary is almost nowhere to be found when facing a good quarterback, and. Um, but they've always played the Eagles tough. They've proven that, and I think it's going to—the the East could potentially come down to Week 17 when the Eagles play Dallas, and, um, <laughs> you know, that, that would be a fun one. I can guarantee that with two rookie quarterbacks, and, you know, both these teams, they just hope to stay healthy. I mean, you, all, you already saw the whole Des Bryant debacle this week where he missed an MRI on purpose because he was fearful of the results, and I think that's one thing that puts the Eagles ahead right now is because they don't have drama in the locker room like they had have had the past couple years, you know, getting rid of Chip Kelly and Peterson coming in. He's really got these guys thinking that they're a team, and they are again, and, you know, from what I've seen growing up watching football, the Philadelphia Eagles have had their years in the past decade, you know, in the past 15 years. But I don't think I've ever seen this Philadelphia Eagles team with, you know, a quarterback who's, you know, really tries hard to not make mistakes, but at the same time has a big arm and can make all the big throws and makes the guys around him better. The offensive line's blocking for him great. Um, they're doing a running back by committee, which you haven't seen for a lot of years since Westbrook was there. And um, I think that the defense is coming up strong. They weren't predicted to be a very strong defense because in the past couple of years they've given up a ton of yards, you know, being that they've been on the field a ton because Kelly doesn't like to be on the field. And um, But, the, yeah, the difference is this year they have all these guys back with all this talent and um, they're healthy and they're performing and they don't have to be on the field as much. So they're feeling confident. They're feeling like they belong there. They're starting to believe in Philadelphia. And, um, yes, yeah, so that wraps up our uh, contender or pretender segment. So we got a couple teams we want to talk about who um, – you know, aren't off to as strong of starts, but maybe we're expected to be, you know, some of them even have a losing record. And uh, the first team I look to is the Arizona Cardinals. Do you still think that they're going to be a playoff team at one and two? Uh, it's hard to say their quarterback play is um, been shaky. Uh, I, I still think they have a, a great defense. I still think um, their defense is one of the best in the NFC, which I think at the end of the day has to be something. I'm not sure. Um, how how far it will get them? Um, I think it'll be close. Um, but I'm also thinking I don't know who else in their comp um, in, in their division would really challenge them at this point. So I, I would I would still say the Cardinals make the playoffs, but um, maybe c- closer than we might have expected at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I think they bounce back this week and beat the Rams, who actually <laughs> lead the West right now. But um, I think that Seattle proved last week that. Their offense is back, and I mean, I think Russell Wilson's going to do a, do a good job for the rest of the season. He kind of started slow last year, too, and people were concerned, and that's kind of been his thing his whole career so far. And um, I think that Seattle's the best team in the West right now, um, even though it may not appear like it, but uh, I think they're going to start putting up points. And I don't know, Arizona just seems to have some sort of problem. I think, I don't know, I think that Palmer's going to play good a lot of games, but he's going to have his games where he really lays an egg, too. And at this point, it's really hard to trust him. You know, I originally picked Arizona to go to the Super Bowl, and I'm I'm pulling back on that one now. I really don't know who it's going to be out of the NFC. you got to give me a few more weeks. But um, I still think Arizona is going to make the playoffs, but I think they're going to be a wild-card team, and I think that their record might not be as good as some people were expecting, and they're going to take a step back because I really I just don't know what's going on with Palmer, and a good team like Arizona cannot go into Buff- Buffalo and get blown out. I mean, that's a joke, and I know it was a must-win for Buffalo, so they played well, but th- that's just not something you can be doing. Um, I think another team you look at is the Jets. They're one and two. They had an absolutely terrible performance from Fitzpatrick last week with six interceptions and, um, you know, a big loss to the Chiefs. They've had a tough schedule to date, and they got more of a tough schedule even going forward. So it's hard to find a playoff spot for the Jets right now. I am actually 
originally picked them to win the division as well, but New England looks so good. There's no way that's going to happen. I'm going to pick the Jets to miss the playoffs, and I'm not going to go losing record. I'm going to go 8-8 eight and eight with the Jets. Uh, yeah, you talk about the record. Their next three weeks are the Seahawks, Steelers, and Cardinals. Um, so I, I think definitely they have a, a hard test. Um, I don't. Yeah, like Nick said, I don't think they're gonna. They can't beat the New England Patriots, or they're not gonna upend them from the number one spot. Um, I, I, I say like seven and nine. I don't even think they have a even or winning record this year. I, I just don't see it happening. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, we got a couple of great games this week as well. One of them is uh, Kansas City coming off a big win against the Jets. Pittsburgh coming off big loss against the Eagles, which you know they look to bounce back, and that's on Sunday Night Football. And um, this one's pretty tough to pick, but I think I'm going Pittsburgh in this one in a bounce back week. I don't think Tomlin's going to have him lose two weeks in a row. What do you think? Yeah, same, especially with their um, offense not scoring a lot of points last week. I think they come back. They score points. Um, don't think Kansas City's defense is going to be quite as strong as um, Philadelphia's was last weekend. Um, so I, I think I think they score more points. I think they win the game. And like you said, they're just not going to lose two weeks in a row, especially not to Kansas City. Yeah, and uh, Monday Night Football, we got uh, Minnesota and the New York Giants, two great primetime games this week. The fans should be looking forward to it. And um, Vikings and Giants, I think that the Giants are a good team. They can score points, but they're going to struggle a little bit. I think this is the best. I mean, it's surely the best defense they've faced so far, and I think that they're still going to score some points against them. But I think Minnesota is going to keep proving that they're, you know, they're trying to be the class of the NFC. And I'm taking the Vikings in this one on Monday night. Who do you got? Yeah, I think um, the Vikings pass rush is going to be too much for Manning. I think he's going to have trouble. He, they have a um, new Giants have a great wide receiver core, so I think it'll be interesting. Um, but I think the pass rush will get to Manning a little more. Um, and I, th- I think it'll be close. I when I first looked at this, I was like, oh, Vikings will destroy them. But I think it's going to be closer than you might think. But yeah, I think Vikings pull it out. Yeah, and uh, another big story we have is uh, out of the AFC South is that it was just announced, I think it was this morning or maybe last night, that uh, J.J. Watt is out for the season because he's going to have back surgery, so he's not going to be playing for the rest of the year for Houston. Uh, how much do you think this affects the Texans? Do you think they're still the front runners to win the division? Uh, that's so hard to say. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say they still win it. Maybe not because of their own talent, but just because I don't a, a lack of maybe everyone else to keep anyone else to like challenge them. Maybe in Indianapolis might sneak in there, but um, I, I I still think they have a decent offense. I think Osweiler was doing well, um, uh, but I I think they still win it. But maybe I, I don't know I don't know about that. That's hard to say. How about you? Um, yeah, this one's tough, but. Like you said, you can't trust anybody else in the division, so you're going to go Houston right now. I think another 9-7 and seven season. Osweiler did, you know, he had his struggles against New England, but I think he bounces back and he'll do fine. They're still the best team in the division. They got a lot of talent on defense and pretty good coaching on defense too, so I think it's still them, but losing Watt does hurt. And I thought that, you know, at the beginning of the season, I was like, oh, Houston's going to surprise some people, and they got the potential to make a real run this year. I think that that shot is now over with the loss of J.J. Watt. And, yeah, that does really hurt them. And, um... I mean, this is, I don't know, this is just a fun little game that we can play. It's just through three weeks, so it doesn't really mean anything. But um, who do you have as the NFL MVP through three weeks if the season ended right now? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I wasn't expecting that question. Um, I'm not even sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do this because I can't think of MVP. I'm going to make you answer that. I'll say rookie of the year is Carson Wentz. Um, I think he looks really good right now. Um, I can't even think of an MVP right now. Um, who, is there someone who you're thinking about? Uh, I think if you could give them, uh, if you could give the MVP to a coach, it'd be Bill Belichick right now with what he's done. But you can't do that. So I think, yeah, you say rookie of the year is Carson Wentz. And, I mean, this is bold, and I do not think it's going to finish the season this way by any means. But if the season ended today, the most valuable player in the NFL is Carson Wentz, not just rookie of the year. He's shown... For a Philadelphia Eagles team that, you know, beat two of the worst teams in the league, but then blew out a Pittsburgh Steelers team who's supposed to be one of the best in the AFC. I think that he has no interceptions. They have not turned the ball over. He is exactly what this team has not had besides the, you know, fluke year from Nick Foles a couple years ago. That he's good. He. If the Eagles make the playoffs, which I think they're going to, Carson Wentz is going to push them all the way there. And the coaching has been huge for him, too. But. 
Carson Wentz is the MVP of the NFL right now. Pro Football Focus has him as the top-graded quarterback through three weeks, and for a rookie, that's crazy. I mean, you know, when the Eagles drafted this guy, I said, yeah, this guy's got potential, but it's going to take him a little bit to be great, but I do think he can be great, and I didn't think he was going to get the shot to play right away, but of course, you know, we know that story now with the whole Bradford situation, who's playing for the other undefeated team, and um, it's hard to find another player who's playing as well and has been as valuable for his team as Carson Wentz, because you look to Dak Prescott, another rookie who's been almost as good, but I do think if Romo was healthy that the Cowboys would be playing just as well, and I think if the Eagles did not have Wentz that they would be nowhere right now, and so with that being said, I think he is the most valuable player in the NFL. So um, yeah, I mean, that wraps up a couple of our last final thoughts here on the ride, so thank you for joining us um, today here in Wichita. I'm Nick Beach. I'm Matt Hopper. And uh, thanks for tuning in.